good to be in the house. Amen. <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. We're um, you know, going to get started on our uh, Bible hour this morning. Amen. We are continuing in the book of um, Mark. And I pray this morning that um, you'll just allow God to speak to you. Amen. That you'll meditate on his words. Amen. And allow, allow him to talk to you. To reveal his truth to you. Amen. Because we want to walk according to his word. Amen. Not our word, not our own desire, but based on what the word of God says that we should do, and uh, that's what we want to do. Amen. And so we are um, in Mark chapter 9. We're going to finish that out this morning. But I um, just want to paint the picture here that Jesus is essentially making his way toward Jerusalem. So he's going south. Amen. For his eventual um, crucifixion. And while doing so, he continued to teach people, to talk to his disciples, amen, continue to work miracles. And so um, we're going to continue this morning, amen. With um, Last week, we ended with um, the scene where the disciples wanted to know who is the greatest, right? Uh, and God revealed that it's not about prestige or power, but it's about serving others. Continuing this vein this morning, um, there's a connection with this story um, where the disciples saw someone casting out devils in Jesus' name. And they forbid them to do so because they said, hey, he's not one of us. He's not one of the selected one, right? He's not one of those who are following you. Um, so we forbid, forbid him not to do so. But Jesus indicated to them that, you know what, that's, that's not right. You should not have done so. Um, because, he says, for he that is not against us is on our part. There is no position of neutrality, so to speak, when it comes on to Jesus. Amen. You're either for him or against him. Uh, if you uh, read the book of Revelation, um, as John the Revelator was speaking to the Laodicean church, the Bible indicate that God would rather you be hot or cold. It says if you're lukewarm, he's going to spew out of his mouth. So there is, you're either for God or you're against him. So these 12 disciples, you can imagine, you know, they receive a special calling from the Lord, right? But we have to understand that God will use people with different gifts for the furthering of his kingdom. It's, we can't get to the, the, uh, 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 the place where we look down on others and say, hey, you don't have the pedigree. You don't have the right background, right? God can't use you. Um, you know, it's not about whether you're first generation or sixth generation Pentecostal. God can use you. Amen. And so... We need to be careful that we don't take this mindset that, hey, you know, because, you know, I go to Bible school or because of my background, I'm more qualified and, and, and you know, um, God can't use you. So that was the concept that, again, that um, it's not about prestige. It's about serving others. That's, that's the important thing. Amen. Paul, in the book of uh, Philippians, began to talk about his background. And his qualification, but he says, you know what, you know, all of these things, I'm going to put them aside, amen, it's not, I haven't arrived, I haven't apprehended, I'm not all that, but he says, you know what, we need to forget about the things that are behind us, we need to forget about these things, amen, and reach forth unto those things which are before us, and press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, amen, it's not about prestige, it's not about education, but it's about the relationship that you have with Jesus. Amen? And that's what we need to focus on. Amen? In, in fact, you know, the Bible tells us that we shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We, we can't do that. Because the Bible says that God has given every man a measure of faith. And because of that, we need to think soberly. Think soberly. Amen? So, an another... Um, thing that I, I believe is tied into this, um, to, to this concept is the warning that Jesus began to give to his disciples. It's called it the solemn warning. 
So Jesus begins and says, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones. And offend here means to cause one to stumble, to lose their way. Um, and, and, and little ones here could be children, or it could be somebody who we consider to be insignificant or weak in the faith. He said, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it's better for him that a milestone were hung about his neck and he were cast into the sea. If you think about it, a milestone, flat, a big stone that is used to grind grain. You know, if that is put around your neck and you're in the sea, it's, it's sure dead, right? You're not going to survive that. But think about the penalty, uh, the eternal penalty that you could face when you cause somebody to stumble and lose their way. Just think about that. And Jesus went on to talk about the fact that it's better for you to essentially lose your, your, your appendages, so to speak, and, and be able to make it into the kingdom than to have everything all together and, um, and miss out. I, if you think about it, um, if you are placed in a position where you have a, a sickness or, or disease appendage, and um, the choice is to lose that and, 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 and continue to live your life, I think most of us would, would, would choose to do that. I mean, my, my mom went through that situation earlier this year when, you know, uh, she had to cut off all her, her um, toes on her one of her foot um, um, for health reason. Because if that wasn't done, it would have been more complicated, more severe. And so this idea of um, hanging on to stuff that's going to cause us to miss out is what God is really talking about. We can't hold on to things that are going to cause us to not follow God. As believers, sometimes we have to make some drastic uh, decision, take drastic steps to leave habits, to leave um, lifestyle that are contrary to the word of God. It is very, it is very important. So pra relationship, practices, authorities, or activities that is going to miss pull us away from God, it's important that we kind of cut those off. Stop those things. So, um, like I said, sometimes it requires drastic actions. Amen. To um, Drastic actions are necessary to keep us from stumbling and receiving eternal damnation. Jesus went on to, 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 to speak about salt. We know in the book of Matthew, it says that we are the salt of the earth. And um, if you read the first um, scripture here, it says, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. As I read that this morning, I was like, what, what is God saying? What, what, is, what is the interpretation here? And there, there, are, there, are, there are many different interpretations, but the one that I, I felt, probably, at least in my mind, is that every believer will be purified by fire. You'll have to go through trials and tribulations that are going to, or should, bring you closer to God or make you act in a way that is more God-like. But we all understand the importance of salt. It's a preservative. Amen. It's a condiment. It's used to preserve food. And, and, and so as I was thinking about that, as a salt of the earth, we need to be preservative in a world that is full with sin. What do you mean by that? Our lifestyle, our action, need to be opposed to what the world is doing. That's being a preservative so that somebody can say, hey, why are you different? You know, I see something different about you. The Bible says that the men may see your work and be led to glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So as, as Christians, we have to maintain our saltiness. And we can only do that 
by having a close relationship with Jesus. That's the only way that that will happen. So we have to allow God um, to, to purify us. Amen. That's the only way that we are going to maintain the saltiness or the flavor, so to speak. We have to be at peace with others. Amen. And the, the Bible indicates that, you know, if the salt, if it, if it loses its flavor, it's, it's, good, it's, it's no longer useful. It's of no value. And so if we lose our saltiness, what is our value to Jesus? What value do we have? If we are behaving as a world, this is a topic that has caused a lot of questions, uh, confusion, and uh, I, I hope this morning that um, I'll be able to um, convey um, what I believe the Bible says when it comes on to marriage and divorce. So we see a scenario here where the Pharisees, again, trying to trap Jesus. So Jesus know their intent. You know, I, I don't like it when somebody know the answer to something and then they're asking me. I'm like, you already know. Why, why, ask, why, why are you asking? Or I, I, I'll commonly say, well, tell me what you think, what we should do in this situation. Um, so they, they, they were trying to trap Jesus. And if you, you think about it, if you recall earlier in the book of Mark, John the Baptist was beheaded because he spoke out about divorce and adultery. And quite likely, the Pharisees may want the same thing to happen to Jesus, right? So they are trying to get him to respond in a way so that they could use what, he's, what, he, what, what he says to accuse him. And so the Bible says, and the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? You have to understand that, in the, that the Jewish society was very patriarchal. So typically, a woman wasn't allowed to initiate divorce. It was all based on the man. So they, so, so they asked, you know, and the Bible says, tempting him, right? Try to trap him. And he said unto them, what did Moses command you? What did the Bible say? I think a lot of times people want to give us their opinion based on their feeling. But we need to go back to the Bible and find out what the Bible says. And he answered and said unto them, what does Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement to put her away. So the, the Pharisees here um, really was focusing on most, there's, there's different writings that Moses um, had done on um, divorce. And they just focus on a small portion. You know, Jesus ov obviously has already know what the word of God says. And these guys really weren't letting up in their attempt to trap Jesus. And so they wanted him to choose sides. They wanted him to choose sides in this controversy to incriminate himself on what you could consider a hot topic. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? If Jesus supported divorce, he certainly would be upholding the Pharisees' procedures. And if you recall, these guys, they add on to stuff, right? They were, there were so many additional reason and additional stuff that, you know, basically they were abusing, um, you know, the, the um, what Moses indicated as a as reason for, for divorce. So if you think about it, if Jesus goes the opposite direction, then they would accuse him of not following Moses' law. So 
How do you respond in such a situation? Jesus removed any possible condemnation or laxity about divorce or ignorance of the law. And he went directly to the Pentateuch, to the book of Genesis, where marriage was instituted. The, the, the Pharisees, in their mind, they were really thinking that Jesus was, was referring to Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 and 4. And we'll, we'll get to this in a minute. But Jesus' response that he was indicated that he was really referencing the ideal state of marriage. In their answer, the Pharisees su summarized Moses' writing in Deuteronomy. Moses permitted divorce by, um, and provided instruction as to how it should be conducted or reasons um, why it should be conducted. Like I said before, under Jewish laws, amen, only the men could um, initiate divorce. And, and in this case, what was happening was that people would just be getting rid of their wife for no reason. So this was in, in, instituted to protect women, so to speak. You could say this is uh, the first case of um, what we call it, civil rights. <laughs> and so this caused people to, to think twice about um, divorce. Jesus indicated that Moses, and I'm not going to read this, but I, I, I want this to be there as a reference. Jesus indicated that Moses allowed this because of the hardness of their heart, because of sin. So it wasn't God's original intention for there to be a separation. God wanted this to be permanent. But because of sin, God, in a sense, um, provided a way that people would not live in sin. You, you can read this when you have some time, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 to 4. So, in a sense, you could say it wasn't recommended or proved by God, so to speak, but preferred to open adultery. God wanted us to consider it permanent. So let's look at this in a little bit. Going back to the book of Genesis, the beginning of creation, God indicated what his ideal was. God's plan was that marriage between a husband and a wife, that they were united in one, that it be an intimate union that should not be separated. The wife is not the property of the husband to be disposed of or vice versa. And so we see a clear distinction between God's original intent and what Moses, um, when Moses wrote the, 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 the laws or bill of divorcement. And, and clearly it was because of sin. Pharisees, they saw divorce as a legal matter. And so that's how they were approaching it, as opposed to a spiritual one. And, and Jesus really condemned this type of attitude. You know, if you, if you think about it, it's not about thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But it's about having a relationship with Jesus, having the laws on your inward part. Amen. That's, that's what it's about. Amen. So Jesus recognized Moses' law. He, remember, Jesus didn't come to, he came to fulfill the law, right? He didn't come to abolish it. So Jesus recognized that and says, yeah, that happens because of sin. Amen, because of the hardness of your heart. Why, why, why this is allowed. So Jesus um, clearly stated that for my people, I have a, I have a, a, higher, a higher standard for my people, so to speak. And you see that when he talked to the disciples, and they began to question Jesus about it. And, and Jesus 
said something which many would consider strange. That because Jesus says, hey, you know, divorce leads to people living a life of adultery. Oh, what, what, what does that mean? And he spoke this specifically to the disciples. To, when I read this, we, we do know that Jesus or, or the Bible provided grounds for divorce, right? We, we, we know that. And let, let, me, let me get into that. I mentioned this before, God's original intention for marriage, that it be a permanent union. And we can read Genesis 2 and verse 24 there. Actually, I, I didn't put it here, but I have it in my notes here. So the ba- if you read the book of Matthew, the Bible tells us um, in Matthew 5, verse 31 to 32, that unfaithfulness is a reason, a grounds for divorce. It says, it had been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that is divorced, committed adultery. So unfaithfulness is grounds for divorce. The Bible also indicates that defraudment or abandonment is another ground. And we can see that in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 15, it says, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. If you study the scripture and understand the relationship that God wants to have and the fact that God wants people to be in oneness in marriage, you could also surmise that abuse is another ground. Because the violation of the oneness of God or the oneness that God intended for marriage leads to brokenness. And God doesn't want people to live in a broken state. This was somewhat earth shaken to the Pharisees because Jesus also went on to say that a woman can ask for a divorce. Can you imagine how um, the Pharisees view this? Because this was contrary to, to, the, to, 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 to the, their laws and their, their, the, the rule of law in their, in their time. So just going back here is that, you know, I want to say that God created marriage to be sacred. His intention was for it to be permanent to be a partnership between a husband and wife when they enter this union. That's the mindset that one needs to take when you go into marriage. It's about commitment. Now, (laughs) there are going to be differences. There's going to be argument. If I stand here and say that, you know, me and my wife never had, never have differences, I'll be lying. We are different people, right? Brought up, uh, I'm from Jamaica, she's from the U.S., different culture. And so there are things that are going to happen. We're going to rub each other the wrong way. But if our heart, if our heart is not hardened and we're committed to each other, then we're going to work through it. We're going to work through our differences. That's the type of relationship that God intended for marriage to be. Things happen. Sin, sin exists, right? Um, and so, um, you know, don't, if, if, if you have gotten a divorce, there's no need for you to feel condemned. There's no condemnation, right? Because there are grounds that God has given. And I would say, if going forward, you know, work on your relationship. Amen. Draw closer. The more... One other thing that I've, I've heard people, I'm, well, I'm going to talk from me. I want God in my marriage. I want more of him in because the more of him I have, the less likely we're, we're going to see separation. Because if we have this relationship with God, God is going to help us with this relationship. Right? And that's what we want. I, I see 
and hear people like, oh, I, you know, no, God, not in this. I'm not, in God, in everything I want you involved. In, every, in everything, God, I want you involved. There's nothing that I want to hold back from you because if God is involved, if God is helping, it's going to be better. It will be better. Amen? So, um, again, Jesus um, was not, um, Jesus did not what, abolish what Moses provided, right? The bill of divorcement that Moses talked about. Um, but God was, was, was talking to, and, and I, I find it interesting because he didn't state this to the general public, so to speak, or the Pharisees. When he had the disciples together, he kind of began to talk to them, um, and indicating to me that as Christians, God has a higher standard for us. He has a high standard, higher standard, amen? And, and, and it's all about having the, the, the laws of God in our heart, amen? I hope I'm, 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 I'm clear this morning I, um, about God's position. Um, you know, God doesn't want people to, to live in a state of abuse, abandonment. Um, that's not, that's not God's design. You know, if we go back to the original design, it's about a union. I, I read something, and it says, you know, Marge is not 50-50. It says it's 100, 100, 100. It says divorce is 50-50, but not Marge. Amen. So we, we, we all need to be committed to working together. Amen. Um, and, and God will help us. Amen. God, God will help us. Amen. We see a, wow. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me that God moves from margin divorce and then begin to address or bless children. Children are important in, in, in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? They are, they are valuable. It's just, a, to me, it's a, just a natural progression from his teaching about uh, his ideal for Marge and his insistence about bringing children to him for blessing. Jesus is often criticized for um, spending time with the wrong people. Sinners, tax collectors, and in this case, children. But Jesus really, by his action, is declaring the value of children. He talked about their receptiveness as to the type of response and relationship that is required for people that want to enter the kingdom. And I begin to think about this, and I, I ask myself the question, am I helping or hindering children from coming to Christ? And here I don't necessarily mean a child, but it could be viewed that way. Somebody who is new to this. Are we helping or hindering them from coming to Christ? And are we approaching the kingdom or receiving the kingdom with a childlike trust? Because that's what Jesus said. It was customary for children to, for people to bring children to the rabbi for blessings. And so we see in this scenario, people bringing their children to Jesus to have him touch them and bless them. But the disciples, they thought, mm, they're not worthy of the master's time. Stop bothering him. You're not important. Everybody's important in the eyes of the Lord. So they told the parents not to bother Jesus, and Jesus was displeased with their action and their insensitivity. And he told them to, to let the children come and not stop them. And, and Jesus went on to say that the kind of faith and trust needed that the, ki that the children are displaying is what is needed to enter the kingdom. Here's what the Bible says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 15. It says, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Jesus took them and he blessed them. 
I want to draw contrast to this trust of a children, the trial-like faith. And the next passage of scripture that we're going to talk about, which is about the rich young ruler. Here is somebody who got it all together. He has wealth, he has fame, he has money, he has riches. And he recognized within himself that he needed to do more that wasn't enough to enter in the kingdom. And so he approached Jesus and he asked a question, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? It's always good to examine ourselves from an unbiased perspective and see how we, how we, are we walking according to God's laws. It's important. This is something that growing up used to be common. People didn't necessarily need someone to kind of point out their flaws. Because they would read the word, they recognize things that are contrary to the word of God. And they would start taking action. So this young man came with a, a genuine need. He really wanted to know what he needed to do to inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus began to talk to him about the laws. Actually, Jesus named six of the, the, the laws or Ten Commandments. And the six that he mentions associated with relationship with others. And the young man says, oh, you know, I've, I've kept them all from I was young. I guess he felt like he was good. Lord, I, I've done all of this stuff. I'm good. Probably felt very pleased, right? But the Bible says, Jesus beholding him with love, or Jesus beholding him, love him. Jesus really wanted to help him. I don't, personally, I don't think Jesus kind of pointed his finger to him and, you know, Jesus did this in a loving way because Jesus truly wanted to help him. God is love. Because Jesus knew what he lacked. Jesus said, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come take up that cross and follow me. The Bible says he was sad. Sad at the same. And he went away grieved. You know, the question is, does God want us to have riches or wealth? Jesus is not about... Jesus wants us to be blessed. But if you begin to think about wealthy people, they believe that their wealth can solve any and every problem. If they feel down, they just spend it and do something that appeases their flesh. When it could be God trying to nudge them. But they use their wealth to solve it. And, and, I, and I would say that Generally, that comes with a, some kind of arrogance. And look what I have done, not giving honor to Jesus. The Bible says that the love of money, not money, is the root of all evil. Because there are certain attitude and certain uh, action that people generally will take when they're in that position. You know, nobody can really talk to them. Nobody can really guide them or instruct them. If they do something wrong, they feel like they can use their money to kind of remedy that situation. So it's not that God doesn't want us to be blessed, but it's really the attitude. Um, and in fact, if you think about it, this young man said that he has followed all the commandments. But the first one was what? Love the Lord thy God. All that heart, mind and soul, have no other God beside me. So he really, really, in reality, his money was 
is God. Because he put that ahead of following Jesus. So he wasn't following the laws as he thought he was. You see, Jesus was drawing attention to the focus of his lifestyle, not just knowledge of his commandments. The law is far deeper than just a list of rules to be kept. It's far deeper than that. The young man sincerely believed that he had not broken any law, commandments, and wanted guarantee to eternal life. You see, we, we cannot attain eternal life or relationship with God through our own merit. We can't, we can't do enough. We can't buy our way in. The Bible tells us that it's the goodness of God that leads us lead to repentance. You see, that his wealth, his money was the one barrier that kept this young man out of the kingdom. His love for money represented his pride of accomplishment and self-effort. And so his attitude made him unable to keep the first commandment, which is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Don't worship any other god beside me. So he did not love God with his whole heart, as he had presumed. His wealth was his god, his idols, and he could not give it up. The one requirement that God gave him He chose to hold on to it, indicating where his heart was. Where, where is your heart this morning? Amen. He didn't turn his whole heart and life over to God. I think it's important that we don't let earthly possessions cause us to miss out on the opportunity to be with Jesus. It is, it is very easy. I, I was thinking this morning that, you know, we talk about, or the Bible, you know, speak about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And, you know, we, we, we're living in an area where, man, you need, you need a little bit of this to kind of be able to um, afford a, a relatively decent lifestyle. And so, God is not opposed to that. The reason why we encourage people to be in the house of the Lord on a frequent basis, you know, I can tell you when I'm traveling for work, my mind is not so much on the word of the Lord. Yes, I read the Bible and all of that. I'm there trying to solve a problem and do all of that stuff so that I can get back. So if that's what I do on a consistent basis, I'm going to be drawing further and further away from God, right? And that's not God's desire, amen? The Bible says, what does it profit a man if he would gain this whole world and lose his soul? The soul is important. It's eternity. I, I was talking to my, my um, cousin over the weekend, um, somebody who we grew up with, um, relatively young. He was 51. He used to live for God, amen, uh, separated from his wife and just started doing his own thing, um, got up what morning, well, at least that's a, what the thought is, um, was making some oatmeal, wasn't feeling well, sat down on a chair, that was it. And we begin to talk because the thing that we begin to discuss is eternity. You know, sometimes we, we don't get it, right? Because we're human. Eternity matters. And personally, I'm not going to do, I'm not somebody who likes to take chances. 
when I invest, I'm more uh, on the conservative investment side. You know, there you can invest in stuff that, yeah, high reward, but it also <laughs> has a high chances of low return. I am steady, steady, steady. Gradual, gradual, gradual. And I'm saying that because I think about eternity. And the things that I'm doing today, the action that I'm taking, the decisions that I'm making, is it helping me to go where I want to go or I need to go? Is it set, setting me up to be on the right side of eternity? Because my intention is to live and reign with God. I can't just act or just make decision on a whim. How does this affect my standing with God? How does this affect my relationship with God? Because it's about eternity. It is about eternity. Now, something that I, I think is important here in this story is, and Pastor spoke about it Sunday night, I wonder if I have it here, is this concept. The Bible says that it's easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle, the eye of a needle, than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. The Bible did not say it's impossible for a rich man, right? That's not what the Bible says. I, I found this picture, and I, I can't um, validate how accurate it is, but this is the best that I could find, which was a, a gateway in a bigger wall, in a bigger um, Bigger gate. Can you picture a camel going through this small opening? For sure, they have to unload the weight and get down on their knees to go through. But I, as I was thinking about this, in order for the camel to go into that city, they have to unload the weight. If, if you think about it, if a rich person want to enter the kingdom of God, they have to do the same thing. Not necessarily about giving away their riches, but the mindset, the humbling yourself. We have to get rid, unload those things so you can enter. The Bible says that we should lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily beset us. I would ask the question today, are there habits, are there weights, are there loads that are preventing you from truly getting to where God wants you to be? Well, think about it. Maybe it's time to start unloading them. The same way that they have to unload that camel. The same way that the camel has to get on its knee. Just think about that as humbling yourself before God. We're talking about eternity. We're not talking about today. We're talking about eternity. And this morning, I, I'm going to end here this morning. But I would say, don't let any earthly possession becomes a barrier for you entering in the kingdom of God. You know, the, the, the word that Jesus spoke here was very surprising to the disciples because in their mind, you know, they would be thinking that, hey, you know, the, the rich man, they have it all together. These are the kind of people that are going to enter in the kingdom. But Jesus was saying, no. And so they, they thought it was really hard, like, who can enter the kingdom of God? And the next few verses really speaks to them talking about how they have given stuff up. How they essentially have left their work, their families, right? And how this positioned them for the kingdom. And God went on to say, you know what? You know, by, by, by doing this, I'm going to reward you. There, there's a reward for selling out to God. There's a reward. The, God, the Bible talks about a hundredfold. I'd say I'm going to end there, but 
is that scripture here? You're not going to lose out by, 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 by the shedding weight, shedding loads that are hindering, that are, that are hindrance for you, for, for, from you serving God. God is going to bless you. Something that I thought, um, I found really interesting is the scripture, I'm trying to find it here. Verse 30 says, but he shall receive an hundredfold, no, in this time, houses, brethren, and sisters, mother and children, and land, with persecutions. Kind of interesting to me that the Lord is talking about reward, and then he mentioned persecution. I, in reality, it's not just the rich that will find it difficult to enter in the kingdom. But our sinful nature can prevent us from doing that. There needs to be a humbling. It's not about merit, the Bible says. But there needs to be a ultimate self-denial in order to follow Jesus' call. And yes, there are benefits, but there will also be sacrifices. There will be sacrifices. We must not selfishly just follow Jesus for rewards. Persecution doesn't mean that God is not keeping his promises or that you have done something wrong by putting your faith in God. But this morning I, I challenge you or us on the concept about giving up the things that hinder us from following Jesus because that's necessary if we want to obtain eternal life. This may look very different for each one of us, but if we examine ourselves, if we are honest and open, just like this young man when he came to Jesus, having the right intention of following Jesus and wanting to know what he needs to do. How do you find out what he needs to do? Read the word of God. Study the word of God. It's a, it's a guidebook. Amen. Uh, we're going to stop here this morning. Um, God loves us. Amen. He loves us. Amen. And uh, let him speak to you. Amen. And show you, amen, areas where you can improve on and grow in because it's all about the relationship with Jesus. Amen. We thank you this morning, God, for your word. I pray that you will bless the food, let it be nourishment to our bodies this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.